John chapter 1 and John chapter 20. And uh, let's open in prayer, and we'll, uh, we'll hop into this. Uh, Jesus, we just passionately love you, and we just pray that, that tonight that you would just give us clarity and wisdom and insight and give us ears to hear, that we may hear uh, what you are wanting to speak to us. Uh, Jesus, we just love you, and thank you for what you're doing in this time. In your precious name we pray, amen. Uh, so I want to read John chapter 20, and uh, we're going to look at verses 30 and 31 for just a moment kind of set a foundation, and we're going to hop back into John chapter 1. <clears throat> so if you have your Bibles, John chapter 20, uh, starting with verse 30. Oh, by the way, it is really good to see everyone. Uh, it is so good to be back. Woo! And after driving for that long, I, I'm not envious of Stephen at all. But uh, it is good to see you all. So uh, John chapter 20, uh, starting with verse 30, it says this. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, what's really fascinating is that as you're going through the book of John, which we're starting in chapter 1 tonight, but as you're going through the book of John, you start to have this tone of, oh, John is written a little different than the other Gospels. And it's probably been a month or two ago that we kind of did a quick overview of the book of John. But John is writing for a particular reason. He's, he's writing it very differently than the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, John's whole intent is a little different. And what I love about the book of John is he tells you exactly why he's writing the book. So if you want to know the purpose of the book of John, John says, oh, let me tell you, which is right here. Let me read this again. John says, the whole reason why I'm writing this book, the whole reason for this account, and you realize uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have been traveling and has been copied and has been going across the ancient world for years and years. And John is probably, you know, 60 to 90 A.D. So this is 30 to 60 years after Jesus. Uh, the other gospel accounts have been out for a while. Why, why would we need a fourth gospel? And John says, oh, let me tell you why I'm pinning this particular gospel for, for this day and age, let me tell you why. And again, chapter 20, verse 30 says, Hey, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. And as we talked about last time, there are seven specific signs that John uses in his gospel to say this is Jesus. So John says, hey, I admit there's more than seven signs. Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. In fact, one of the passages that John says is, if you were to take all the miracles that Jesus did and combine them into, uh, into an account, the books of the world could not contain all the stories. Could you imagine how many of those there would have to be? How many miracles in order for the Library of Congress to be too small to carry them all? I mean, I just, that's incredible to me. And John says, I only picked seven of them. I know that there's a whole lot more, but let me tell you why I wrote these. Verse 31. But I wrote these, these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Uh, just as a really quick overview, the word there, believe, that he uses, is the word pistu, pist, pistuio. Uh, and if you want it spelled, it's P-I-S-T-E-U-O. Pistuio. And the root word of this word believe is this word here. It's Pistis. So this one means believe. This one means faith. And uh, David's been walking us through a little bit of this um, and on his uh, John studies. There is a difference between belief and faith, but not very much. Because the very root of belief is faith itself. And the way I've been trying to describe it to the teenagers on Sunday morning is uh, belief. See, it's not just, oh, I have faith in something. Oh, I just believe, you know, I believe that there are elephants down at the Nashville Zoo. It's not that kind of a deal. Well, there may be elephants down at the Nashville Zoo. And I believe that, but that's not what we're talking about. Uh, what we're talking about with this idea of belief is 
Here we are in an airplane, and we're flying. We're at 10,000 feet. And in about 30 seconds, the door is going to open, and they're going to push you out, whether you're ready or not. Now, you do have the opportunity to strap a parachute on your back, and as you're throwing, as you're being thrown out of the door, you can hold on to that parachute. My question is, how tight are you going to hold to your parachute? I don't know about you, but if I'm being thrown out of a plane, I'm holding on to my parachute for dear life. Why? Because if the parachute comes off, I'm not interested in that. At least not today. Tomorrow may be a different story, but for today I'm not interested. So I'm going to have faith in my parachute. I'm going to grab hold of my parachute as tight as I can, and if I'm being thrown out of a plane at 10,000 feet, you better believe that I'm going to be holding tight to that thing as tight as I can. That's this idea. It's not belief in terms of mental, mental understanding. It's belief in terms of in experience, in relationship, I'm going to be holding as tight to whatever it is that I'm believing in as, as tight as I can. And John says, do you know why I wrote the book of John? Oh, it's so that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Not, well, you know, I read it in the newspaper earlier today. Not that kind of belief. It's, would you throw yourself upon Jesus like a person being thrown out of an airplane would hold tight to a parachute? Uh, would you hold tight to Jesus so tightly that it's not just, well, yes, I believe that Jesus came and he died and he, he rose again. Satan believes that. So, hey, that doesn't make you a Christian. Well, what makes you a Christian? Oh, holding tight to who he is. So would you embrace him? Would you cling to him? Would you just, whoa, and not let him go? John says, that's why I've written this book. Which means then that everything that you read in the Gospel of John then has to be filtered or interpreted through this understanding. That the reason that he's writing only seven miracles, the reason why he's writing seven particular people who give testimonies to who Jesus is, the whole, the whole purpose of the book is so that you would embrace Jesus and cling to him as tight as you can. Isn't that awesome? I like that. And he says in verse 31, I'm writing this again, that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you would have life in his name. Uh, the word there, life, is the Greek word zoe. Uh, Zoe is often compared in the, uh, in, the, in the same similar manner to the word bios. Uh, most of you went to school, I hope. And 7th, uh, 8th, eighth, ninth, 10th grade, somewhere around there, I, most people take a biology class. Uh, that's this word, bios. Uh, what is biology? Anybody? Okay, it's a study of Nature is a study of how things live. It's a, st it's a study of basic life, if you will. Zoe, well, it's kind of like that, but it's different. Uh, zoe is kind of the same word where we get the word zoology from. And you say, well, then what's the big deal? Uh, bios, if you just want a simple definition, it means like a period, a means, the manner of existence, that kind of thing. Whereas zoe... Uh, it's the idea of existence. That sounds too confusing. Let me try this again. Uh, bios is the idea of just the basic study of life. Zoe is obviously life, but there's more of an emphasis on it. Uh, bios would be, we are living creatures. We're going to do a study of humanity. It's going to be human biology. Zoe, on the other hand, it's life, but it's the, ba the, ba the best way to understand the word zoe is a life that you cannot produce. For example, uh, and I'm not an artist, so bear with me. We have a conduit. Anybody know what a conduit is? A what? Okay, so it's a, it's a pipe, it's a wire kind of a deal. Has, so let's just call it a wire. That makes, does that make more sense? Zoe is not the wire itself. Zoe is the electricity in the wire. For example, uh, we come into the sanctuary, we flip on the lights. Is it the light bulbs that are giving off the light? Well, yeah, kind of. That's what we obviously see. But what is the real source of the light? Oh, 
The electricity. Well, how is the electricity getting from the switch to the light? Well, there's a whole series of wires. and This is over my head, so I'm trying to be very simple so I can understand it. But I flip on a switch, and somehow it opens up this little channel over here that lets the electricity go through here over to there and hits the light, and whoa, the light is illuminated. And if I turn off the switch, it shuts off the flow. The light is no longer illuminated. And it's amazing to me how fast this happens because I can be on the other side of the room, flip the light, and the light can be on over there in a matter of as soon as I hit the, hit the switch. Zoe, then, is not the wire. Zoe is the electricity in the wire. So listen to what John's saying. He says, oh, do you know why I'm writing the book of John? I'm writing the book of John that you would believe, not just a mental understanding, but that you would fully embrace Jesus that you would fall in love, that you would cling to him for everything that you need. And when you do that, guess what he becomes? Oh, he becomes your life. You become the wire through which Jesus, the current, flows himself through. And you literally become the, the demonstration of a living God, not because you're producing the light, not because you're the electricity, but because the electricity is having full freedom to do what it wants inside your life. Isn't that neat? Do I produce the light? No. Do I produce the electricity? No. I'm merely the wire through which he does his stuff through. It's like when Paul says, we are merely a clay pot demonstrating the glory of God. And the word clay pot really just means a crack pot. It's the idea that Jesus is being seen through us as crack pots. In fact, the more cracks and bumps and problems you have, the more Jesus can be seen. Why? Because we look at you and go, you, there's no way you could be doing this. So obviously it has to be Jesus. So the more problems you have, it's actually a better thing. So congratulations. Uh, you can actually, hey, I think that's a good thing. But Zoe, again, is the life within. Isn't that neat? So John says, oh, do you know why I'm writing this? That you would cling to Jesus, embrace him, and when you do that, you find that you, not just, we're not talking physical life here. You have physical life. What we're talking is about a whole other dynamic of life that you cannot produce on your own, that the moment that you embrace and believe in Jesus, suddenly you release him to become all that he was intended to be in your life, and now he is the electricity, he is the current, the flow of your very being. So would you embrace him in that? Now everything in the book of John has to be understood, and this is why John is writing. Does that make sense? All right, so turn to John chapter 1. <clears throat> John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 1. <clears throat> now, uh, just to say a front... I'm a little nervous tonight in the sense that this is probably going to be uh, a little technical. Uh, we're not going to be looking at Greek and that kind of stuff, but it, it's just it's more technical than what I'd probably prefer. But I think it's pretty, pretty profound if you just stick with it. So I just ask for grace and patience uh, as we walk through this, if you'd be so kind. Uh, John chapter 1. Verse 1 through 18 is basically an introductory statement that John is inserting at the beginning of his book. And basically what he's doing is saying in, in verses 1 through 18, I'm going to set up a stage upon which I'm going to launch into my actual story of Jesus. So I'm going to build this platform, and you're going to see everything through this lens. Now again, at the end, he tells you why he wrote the book. But at the beginning, he's saying, I want to literally set a stage for who Jesus is. Now, you may know from your other Gospels that John does not start with the birth of Jesus. In fact, when you actually get into the story, it starts when Jesus is about 30 years old, John the Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan, and Jesus just happens to show up one day. And it's like John says, I don't want you to get confused. I don't want you to have this understanding that here's Jesus, he was born and he's raised, and suddenly he just pops out at 30 years old on the stage of the world. It's not, well... It wasn't born, he just somehow miraculously appeared like an angel, and he just showed up on the stage and started doing miracles. John says, I almost need to give you some context in which to understand the person of Jesus. 
So he begins by saying this. This is just incredible. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And then he goes into this thing about John and the word becoming flesh. And John says, oh, let, me get, let me just tell you about Jesus. Jesus is in the beginning. Jesus is the Word. And later, down in verse 14 through 18, you find out Jesus, the Word, has become flesh. And you step back and you go, John, I don't get it. Do you realize that John is not just talking about a beginning in terms of you being born beginning? John is talking about from eternal ages past, Jesus has always been. Which means Jesus was not created. Jesus has always been. Jesus did not suddenly appear one day. Jesus has always been. Jesus has been from eternal past. He's going to be into eternal future. Yes, there was a moment in time when Jesus was born in the flesh, in a physical body, but even before that point, Jesus has always been. So when we're saying that the beginning of Jesus' life, we often refer to the birth scene, but that's not true in, in its fullest form. Why? Because Jesus has always been. He's always had life. Everyone okay so far? So Jesus has always been. And John says, let me give clarity to this, in the beginning, Jesus has always been. Now, what's really neat, in the beginning is the same phrase that is used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Speaking not of the very point of, of time, because you realize here's the beginning of the creation thing. God has always been before this. Which, don't think about it too hard because you'll hurt your brain. I'm, I mean, I'm serious. If you start thinking about eternity, it's like, I don't get it. That nobody ever created God. God has always been. Don't try. It just hurts. So in the beginning, we're talking about a time that God has always been. For eternity, he's always been. And at one point, he says, oh, at this moment, I'm going to create a whole new deal. In the beginning, whoa, and God creates the heavens and the earth. And that literally starts what we would call time. Before that, you'd probably say there's no, been no time. Because God has always been. How you want to wrap your mind around that? I don't know. So in the beginning, God creates. And John says, Jesus was there at that point. In fact, Jesus has always been before that point. Again, think through it tonight if you want to, but get ready to lose some sleep because it's just going to hurt your head. It's like drinking a Slurpee too fast. That was a joke. Uh, did you know that this is just totally side comment? I was so disappointed. I learned, it was like two weeks ago, that it was free Slurpee Day at 7-Eleven. <laughs> July 11th, 7-Eleven is always a free Slurpee Day. And I was out in the middle of nowhere with no access to 7-Elevens to get a free Slurpee. <laughs> it was a very depressing day. <laughs> Just speaking of Slurpees. Um, which I don't think we have 7-Elevens out here, do we? Oh, I guess it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Well, never mind. I just like the idea of a free Slurpee. That had nothing to do with anything. So in the beginning, in the beginning, Jesus has always been. And he says this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And we find out in verse 14 that the Word became flesh. So obviously, John is saying that the Word is Jesus. Jesus equals the Word. Word equals Jesus. Jesus is the Word. <coughs> Nod your heads. Jesus is the Word. Now, my question to you is this. If I said, oh, Word, what does the Word mean to you? What does the word Word mean to you? Okay, so obviously it means Jesus. 
But if you heard the if you heard the word word, what do you think of? Think of word, which is what? I mean, what, what do you think of when you hear the word word? Okay, so a thought or something. You, you cannot talk without words, so you talk, you're thinking of vocabulary, perhaps? Speech. Um, thought. Letters. What else do you think of the word word? Anything? Microsoft? <laughs> well, that is a true statement. Huh? Communication? So when I say the word word, what usually goes to our mind is a group of alphabet letters, uh, some sort of thought or a speech or vocabulary. Isn't it interesting? Or the Bible, that's another one that we didn't put up here. We call the Bible the word. <clears throat> What's interesting to me is, out of all the words to call Jesus, why would John pick the word word? Have you thought about this? Oh, that's also another. The word awesome shows up too, by the way. Like, dude, that is totally word. Obviously, um, I'm in the wrong group of people, but. Uh, that, that would be a that would be an old teenage group, yes. Back in the day. That is so that is so bad, which means good. That's the bomb, which means it's awesome. That's gnarly, if that's more of your more of your thing. So, <laughs> uh, so the word would be awesome. Well, why would, why would John use the word word? So I, what I want to walk you through is two frames of thinking. Um, you realize that when John wrote the book of John, it was roughly 30 to 60 years after the death of Jesus. And by this point, the message the, of, 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 of Jesus the, the Christian propagation, oh, that's not how I should say it. Uh, the movement of Christ across the land was just exploding. People were coming to Christ like crazy. In fact, they, they estimate that by 60 A.D., this is 30 years after the death of Jesus, by 60 A.D., the gospel had spread all over Asia Minor, Greece, and was in Rome, and that for every Jew that was a Christian, there was approximately 100,000 Gentiles that were Christians. Isn't that crazy? So if you think, just in the upper room, that's 120 people in the upper room. We're not even talking the 5,000 who accepted, or the 3,000 and the 5,000 who accepted Christ within a, you know, a short period of time. We're just talking 120. Do you realize that by that point, just with 120, that would have already made a million Gentile believers? let alone the 3,000 and the 5,000. I mean, that's just a lot, of, it's a lot of people becoming Christians. So if you think about this, here is this Jewish religion, because Christianity started off as a Jewish religion, that's now being believed by all these Gentiles. In fact, the Gentiles are overwhelmingly outnumbering the Jews in the belief of Jesus. But you have an interesting dilemma. The Gentiles do not understand the Jewish customs, uh, concepts, thought processes, history, background. They had no comprehension of a coming Messiah. You realize that the idea of a coming Messiah was a Jewish thought thing. Gentiles weren't thinking, oh, a Messiah is going to come and save me. Now, obviously, the wise men in Babylonian had that idea. But as a whole, Gentiles do not think of a coming Messiah. That's a Jewish thing. So John, here's John, how on earth is John going to communicate to this group of people who have no idea about Jewish background, who don't understand the idea of a coming Messiah? How do you communicate that? And so here is John, um, probably living in Ephesus or possibly on the island of Patmos, and he's looking around and here's this huge culture of just Gentile believers who hey, we have Matthew, we have Mark, we have Luke, but predominantly they are written to Jewish believers. 
And John says, I almost need to articulate to the Gentiles that they need Jesus just as much as the Jews need Jesus. And he says, oh, I'm going to write a gospel that emphasizes the fact that the Jews needed Jesus as much as the Gentiles need Jesus. But then here's the problem. If you're trying to write to both groups of people saying, you need Jesus, how are you going to communicate that to both groups? who have two completely different mindsets, who have two different cultural understandings. One understands Messiah, the other one doesn't understand Messiah. How, how are you going to communicate that? And John finds a word that happens to be used by both groups that he can commandeer, if you will, and push Jesus. And that word was the word, word. See, before this point, the Jews had an understanding of the word word. And before this point, Gentiles had an understanding of the word word. And so John says, oh, I could use one word, word, and both groups will understand what I'm trying to say. And so when I say Jesus is the word, both groups will go, ha, ah, I know what you're talking about. What a what a what? Oh, what did word mean? Thank you for asking. Let's get into it. <clears throat> so what I want to do is I want to look at the Jewish understanding, and then I want to look at the Gentile understanding, and how Jesus fulfills both of those, and then what that means for our life. So just kind of quickly, uh, we're going to start with the Jewish. So let's start with the Jewish understanding. Uh, first one, of uh, the idea of word. First Jewish understanding is this. It is not a sound. It's not a sound. Uh, in the Jewish mind, words had an independent existence. Uh, in other words, words could do things. See, a word wasn't just something you said. A word carried a life to it. Uh, in fact, one, one professor said it this way, the spoken word to the Hebrew, or the Jew, was fearfully alive. It was a unit of energy charged with power. Meaning that when you used a word, it wasn't just a word. It had significance to it. It wasn't just something you said. It had a meaning. It had depth. And it almost took on a life of its own. Which is fascinating because uh, when you look at Greek words, the Greek language, uh, Greek, I'll... The Greek language has over 200,000 different words. I should have looked up what it was in English. Anybody know? There's a lot in English, too. But in the Greek, there are 200,000 different words. But in Hebrew, anybody want to take a guess of how many words there are? There is less than 10,000. Do you realize how hard it would be to communicate in Hebrew? They say that the average person, and it's been so long since I've looked this up, speaks like a thousand different words a day. Is that right? Anybody know? I'm just, did you know that 68% of all statistics are made up on the spot? Uh, so roughly a thousand words. I, I really have no idea how many words it is a day, but it's something like, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, as I'm saying, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just making up numbers. It's horrible. Uh, but it's like a male, a, a guy would speak, I think it's like something like a thousand different words a day, and a woman, I think it's double that. <laughs> Which is, I'm not saying anything about that. I'm not saying you, my assumption is that means that women are smarter and more articulate because they can use other words. 
That's how I'm understanding it. Shakespeare, they said Shakespeare, uh, his vocabulary was roughly that as big as, or bigger than a normal woman's too, but whatever. Not say, I'm just, I'm digging a hole. Um, so for the Greeks, let's get back to here. The Greeks, hey, they had all these different words. But Hebrews, if they, if, in Hebrew, if you're going to speak something, they didn't have as many options. So the words took on a life of its very own, and certain words would mean several different things. And based on the context, you go, oh, it means this. And you would just, it, it had a life to it. That each word had to carry so much depth because, hey, you didn't have a lot of options. So it wasn't just a sound that you spoke. It literally had life to it. Uh, there was a, uh, there's an illustration that I found I thought was really funny. There was these <clears throat> Christian missionaries who were in a desert. Uh, it was like the Sahara Desert out in Arabia. Or I guess it would be in the Arabia Desert, not the Sahara. Anyway, they're out in this Arabian area, and they come across these people on camels. And they were Muslim, and the Muslims look at these missionaries and say, Oh, peace be upon you. And they started asking the missionaries some questions, realized that they were Christian missionaries. And they looked at the Christian missionaries, and they say, We take back our blessing. It's just, it's just words. It's just sounds that you're puffing out in the air. That's not their mindset. See, the words had power. And the fact that you pronounced a blessing, it was assumed that a blessing was going to take place. And so for them to pronounce a blessing upon Christians, they said, oh, we've got to take that back. See, that was this mentality. See, words convey something. Uh, for example, when you stand up and you say the pledge, it's not just words. There's a depth behind it that has significance, or should have significance. Uh, they say that John Knox, who's a big preacher and uh, just, just completely changed the face of Scotland uh, centuries ago, uh, he was the man who said, he was in his prayer life, he would say, God, give me Scotland or I'll die. In other words, I'm, I'm so wanting you to have such a movement upon Scotland that you either better kill me or you better move. That's your only options. Because there was such a burden for, the, for Scotland on his life, on his heart. They say of John, John Knox that when he would preach, that him preaching would put more courage in your heart than if 10,000 trumpets, trumpets blew in your ear. Does that make sense? So when he would preach, there'd be such a courage and such a, a movement of the spirit in, in, the, in the hearer's lives that is actually bigger and more important than if we had 10,000 trumpets blowing in your ear. They're just sounds. No, it had a life to it. There was depth to it. Oh, one of my favorite preachers, George Whitfield, at the same time as John Wesley, I think this is hilarious, says that George Whitfield would preach, and he, you know, he would preach in front of crowds of like, you know, five, six, seven, eight thousand people, and they had no microphones, so he would just be loud and boisterous, and whoa, and he would preach, and 10,000 people could hear him. And they said that the way that he would pronounce words could move you. Well, they're just sounds. No, there was power behind the sounds. My favorite, my favorite story of John, uh, George Whitfield was uh, the way that he would pronounce Mesopotamia. If he was preaching and he said the word Mesopotamia, there's all these reports that grown women, women would just break out in tears by the way that he would pronounce Mesopotamia. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. It's a word. I mean, Mesopotamia. It's like saying hippopotamus, I don't cry. But apparently there was such a power behind the word that grown woman would start to shed tears. See, it's not just sounds. There's, there's depth to it. Uh, Winston Churchill in World War II. Anybody, can, anybody quote it? What was the big war cry? I wasn't even alive during this time. Oh, yeah, I was like, I wasn't either. 
Hey, the big one was, hey, never, 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 never. Come on, somebody. Never. Hey, we're going to stand in the middle of this. And do you know what it did on, over the radio? It literally produced courage in the life of all of England. I mean, see, it's not just sounds coming out of somebody's mouth. It's, oh. Uh, so that was the Jewish understanding the word word. Uh, another one, and we're just going to fly through these, the rest of these pretty quickly. Uh, the rest of these, oh, I guess this one's pretty tied to it, but there's, there's power in the word itself, which we've been talking about. And uh, just, just some illustrations, biblically, uh, Jacob and Esau, the brothers, Isaac is about to die, and he's going to pronounce his blessing, and Esau went out and was finding the food, and Jacob sneaks in and steals the blessing. Esau comes back in later and says, oh, here I am, Father, bless me. And Isaac says, I can't. What are you telling me you can't? All you're doing is saying words over somebody. Can you not bless me? And Isaac says, I can't. I've already given my blessing. What do you mean? They're just words. No, the words had power. And Isaac, Isaac said, I'll, I'll pronounce something on you, but it's not going to be a blessing. And you're going to have to serve your brother. And da, 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 and See, the words have power and significance. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. God speaks and worlds are created. See, they're not just sounds. They're not just words. There's oh, to it. There's power. There's significance. There's depth. There's movement. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the third one is what are called Spell it right here. Targums. Which is a new word for your vocabulary. So if you use this one today, it increases your number of words per day. Targums. T-A-R-G-U-M-S. <clears throat> uh, targums, if I understand it correctly, about 100 years before Jesus came, you understand that uh, there's about a 400-year period um, during this whole time, everyone was taken into captivity, and they were in these other foreign countries, and eventually they came back, and they've been reestablishing themselves. Well, what happened during this whole process was the Hebrew language was kind of lost. And the only people who understood Hebrew were the scholars, the educated ones, uh, a few of the priests. Everybody else was speaking Arabic, or Aramaic, sorry. And uh, so here's these big scholars, and they're speaking Hebrew, and they know the Hebrew, but the common folk, hey, they don't, they don't understand. It's like during the Reformation, the word was preached in Latin, and everyone's showing up to church and sitting through service, but no, hey, nobody knows Latin anymore. And it's almost like you needed to hear it in your common language. So what they used to do is, uh, here's the Hebrew scholar who knew Hebrew, and he would stand up on, on Saturday morning for church, and he would start to read in the Hebrew Bible. And the person over here would have their Aramaic, which is similar to Hebrew, but it's, it's a little bit different. And he would have his, his Bible, and he would repeat the Hebrew in Aramaic. And then the, the scholar would preach in Hebrew, and then he would translate in Aramaic so that the common people could understand. Now, the translations of the Hebrew Old Testament into Aramaic is called a targum. Does that make sense? So a targum is the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Bible. That may mean nothing to you. Why that's important is when these were created, the Targums, so this is like 100 years before Jesus, when the Targums were created, it was during a time when the Jews had the idea of distancing God, and they did not want to give God human personality. So there's the idea that God was completely separate, God was out there somewhere, he's not interacting in my life, and we should not give God human qualities. Now, the problem with that, as you probably understand, is the Bible is full of that. God's always talking about his nearness. God is always talking about, he's, he's using things like, oh, I want to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks. Or, hey, I want to, hey, I'm your father, and I want to bring you here. And So that stuff's all over scripture. Well, they didn't, they see, they didn't want to have all that kind of stuff. So what they began to do, this is really fascinating, is the places in the Bible where God talks about, ooh, this is me and my nearness, they would replace that with the Word of God. 
So the word of God, the, the saying, word of God, became a substitute for all these little sayings. Let me just give you an illustration. Uh, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, I'll just read it to you, you don't have to turn there. Speaking of the Sabbath, God says, the Sabbath is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. So in the Hebrew, it says, hey, the Sabbath is a sign between me and you. So the Targum, the way that they translated into the Aramaic, was that Sabbath was going to be a sign between my word and you. See, they were trying to distance God. And in the replacement, they put the word of God, or the word. Okay? Let me give you another one. Deuteronomy 9.3. It says, God is a consuming fire, which is phenomenal. I love that picture. God is a consuming fire. So the targum of that then, the way they translated it was, the word of God is a consuming fire. I kind of like that too, truth be told. Now, I understand they're trying to distance God. They're trying to push him away, if you will. They're, they're trying to not let him have human personality. For example, Isaiah 48, 13 says, My hand laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. So the way they translated it was, By my word I have founded the earth, and by my strength I have hung up the heavens. Now, I understand you can make some argument that it's a horrible translation, and we don't base our Bible on the Targums, which is good. But in the Jewish mind, you realize, while Jesus was walking on the earth, during that whole season of time, when they heard the word, the first thing they thought about was what was going on in the Targums. That the word of God has life. The word of God has personality. The word of God has nearness. And the word of God became a substitute for the name of God. That makes sense. So it was just a common thing in their day. Um, so they're just, they're just accustomed to speaking that all the time in all their services. Uh, the fourth one, really quick, is the idea of logos, which is the word, word, in the Greek. <clears throat> now, the Jewish mind of logos uh, was there. So in the Greek, this is the word, word. But in Hebrew, it's the word, Sophia. It's the idea of word. It's the idea of reason. Uh, if you open up to the book of uh, song, uh, Proverbs, I mean, open up to the book of Proverbs, you start to find that wisdom, Sophia, wisdom, is a character, is a person in the book of Proverbs. For example, look at Proverbs uh, chapter 8 and 9. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. Wisdom is a person. I mean, it's given human qualities. As if to say, oh, if you could find and track down wisdom, she would be a, she'll be like treasure to you. She would be, see, they're giving wisdom human personality. And so in the Jewish mind, logos made sense. Why? Because, hey, we've used the idea of word and reason as a person. And it's beautiful if you want to look at the book of Proverbs, and every time you see the word wisdom, you can insert the name Jesus. Because all that saying about wisdom in the word is, is about Jesus. So, in other words, if you were to take all four of these things, uh, let, me, let me read what one, what one scholar said about the Jewish understanding. He says this, It's as if John is telling the Jews, Hey, if you wish to see the word of God, if you want to see the creative power of God, if you want to see what the word has brought to, oh, it's just, sorry. If you wish to see that the word has brought the world into existence and which gives light and life to everyone, look at Jesus. Because he is your word. Hey, he's not just a sound. He has power. He has substance. He has life to him. Hey, all the stuff you've been speaking about in the Targums, hey, you know what? He actually is the fulfillment of it. He is the word. In fact, he is God. He is the Logos. He is the he is the wisdom. He's the reason. He is the person in Proverbs that you keep quoting. So in the Jewish mind, when John said the word word, logos, they would go, oh, I know what you're talking about. And it would make sense. Now, in a Gentile's mind, let me give you three really quick ideas. Uh, the first one
I don't know how you want to pronounce that. Uh, there was a philosopher in Ephesus about 500, 500 B.C., so about 500 years before Jesus. And this Greek philosopher, his name was Heraclitus, and that one, thank you, Heraclitus, 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 everywhere, Heraclitus, Cletus. Uh, sorry, that was dumb. Uh, so this philosopher about 500 B.C., he said stuff about the word word. Uh, he said stuff like, the whole universe is in a state of flux. It's always shifting, it's always changing, but while it's always shifting and always changing, it's not haphazard. It's not by accident, it's not just chaos. There is an order to the flux, the change. Do you know what he said the order was? Logos, the word. In other words, the reason of God, the word of God, is what keeps the entire universe from being chaotic. That everything's in a state of flux, but what keeps it in order is the reason, the word of God. That's what he said, 500 years before Jesus. Uh, he says that the word logos, the word word, was the principle under which the entire universe continues to exist. Meaning, if you were to remove this, the universe would collapse. Why? Because it's like the universe was built upon the idea of logos. Um, he said, hey, if you ask yourself the question, how do you know right from wrong? Hey, what allows us to think or to reason? Uh, what, an, what allows us to know truth? Do you know what his answer was? It was the logos within us. The, the word. So 500 years even before Jesus, in the Greek mind, it was already starting to be perpetuated that the logos was a thing that controlled everything. The logos is what created everything. The entire universe was built upon the shoulders of Logos. And the only reason the entire universe didn't collapse was because we had the Logos. Now, they didn't understand it in terms of Jesus, you understand. But they understood it in terms of the reason, the wisdom of God. Now, the, other, the second thing... was Stoicism. Now... Stoic, in today's understanding, uh, is being able to endure, to endure pain or hardship uh, without showing that you're in pain, that kind of idea. But Stoicism, back in the Greek mind, was a philosophy that taught that virtue was the highest good, and it was based on logos. And in fact, they took what Hera, how do you say it? Heraclitus, thank you, what he said, and they took it a step further. For example, they said they asked questions like, what keeps the stars in their course? What makes the tides ebb and flow? What makes the day and night come in regular order? What brings about the seasons? And their answer was, oh, all things are controlled by the logos of God. That's what their answer was. Now, in their mind, God was not our God. I understand that. But they understood the logos in that manner. Uh, the third one, really quick. is Philo, which was a Jewish Greek historian. So he lived in Egypt, in Alexandria. Um, he was a Jew, so he knew all about Jewish history, but he was also a Greek scholar, and so he knew all about the Greek history. Uh, he said that Logos, the word, is the oldest thing in the world, and it was the instrument through which God made the world. In other words, God took the Logos, created the world, and literally stamped upon the universe the Logos itself. Now, to a Greek or a Gentile, these three made sense. So when someone said Logos, they go, oh, I know what you're talking about. Hey, the universe was created by the Logos? Hey, the universe is really shouldered by the Logos. Logos is the reasoning and understanding of the word. So John comes up to the Gentiles and says, Oh, let me tell you who Jesus is. He is the Logos. He's the one who created everything. He's the one that the universe is built upon the shoulders of. He's the one that's keeping the stars in place. And he's the one that's literally everything. Hey, Logos people, Logos. So isn't it fascinating 
Now here's John trying to communicate to two different groups who have two different mindsets. And God literally gives him a word that is able to communicate to both groups and says, hey, I have the answer that you've been looking for. Hey, you know that thing that you've just been struggling with and you're just seeking for an answer and you're, you're, you know that there's something bigger than you? Oh, it's the word. And his name is Jesus. And to a Jewish, the, hey, in a Jewish mind that made sense. To a Gentile mind, hey, that made sense. So wouldn't it be fascinating? Here we are in the 21st century. And we may not have these understandings of the word word. But could the word have every answer and solution for your life? I love the idea that John takes a word that's being used by several different groups, but he repackages it and says, let me give a new definition, let me give a new understanding, let me give you a new depth that's always been there, but I want you to see it. And he literally launches into his gospel by saying, let me talk to you about this man whose name is the Word. And he's not just, he wasn't just created, he's always been. Which, you understand, makes sense in the, in the Gentile mind. Because it was the word that created everything and keeps everything in, in working order. How would you be willing to embrace him as the word? Who is, yes, he's a, he's a thought. Yes, he's a word. Yes, he's, he's a bunch of letters. Yes, he's awesome. But it's more than that. He's, he's the solution to everything. He's the creator of the entire universe. The word is not just something you say. The word holds power because it's a person. Would you be willing to embrace him? And would you let the word of God, both in a physical sense and in the biblical sense, meaning the living word and the written word, would you let the word of God change your life by embracing him? Why? Because the whole reason that John's saying all this is that you would believe, not just a mental thing, but would you hold and embrace him? And by embracing him, would you let him be your life? The very electric current, the source of who you are. Uh, it's probably a little technical, and I apologize. But I think this is just fascinating. Now, I'm a nerd, so this stuff is always fascinating. But I don't know how you want to apply this into your life except to say, the word is the word. I mean, and would you embrace him? Well, let's pray. And uh, Jesus, we just love you and uh, thank you that you can be our word. Uh, that it's not just something that we say, it's not just a sound, but you are the very the flow, the essence, the power of our life. Lord, somehow would you change our thinking, would you invade our mind, would you change our heart, so that all that we need and every answer that we are looking for is somehow found in you, would you be the fullness of all that we need? Uh, Jesus, we just love you and thank you for what you're doing in this time. May we embrace you ever tighter. Would you be the flow and the source of our very lives? And through you, would you be our life? Uh, we just thank you and love you for what you're doing in these days. Precious and holy name we pray. Amen.